Welcome, my dear students, to my first video lecture from semester one of our two-semester general chemistry course entitled Chem 1210. I'm Dr. Mike Christiansen from Utah State University, and I'm excited to indoctrinate, <laughs> I mean, teach you about the wonderful world of chemistry. Chemistry is about more than just blowing stuff up, although we totally get to do that sometimes, and it's really cool. But why in the world would anyone want to study chemistry? Well, my best slash wordiest answer is that chemistry is a fundamental science devoted to studying the near infinite number of physical interactions that occur all around and inside of us. Chemistry is an essential bedrock field for anyone interested in pursuing scientific, engineering, or medical careers. Organic chemists like me, in particular, are the scientists in charge of inventing new ways of making medicines. With po proper accreditation, students with bachelor's degrees in chemistry can enjoy prosperous careers as industry researchers or public educators. Chemists that have more advanced degrees can teach in community colleges or universities, or they can work as industry research leaders, business professionals, patent attorneys, or political advisors, or roadies for the Rolling Stones. And what should you hope to gain by watching this endless series of video lectures? Wealth, power, and prestige, of course! No, I'm just kidding. Instead of all of that crap, what you'll actually learn if you watch and retain the information presented in this lecture series is, one, you'll understand the basic principles of general chemistry. Two, you'll be able to explain basic everyday chemical phenomena and apply your knowledge to solving real world problems. And three, you'll be able to explain why chemistry is important and how it applies to everyday life. Now, our text for this class, or for this YouTube lecture series, for those of you who aren't privileged enough to be taking this from me in person, will be Chemistry, the Central Science, 12th edition, by Brown, LeMay, Burston, Woodward, Murphy, and the entire cast of Friends. Now we get into the nitty gritty. You'll see quickly that before every single lecture that I give, I always provide a punch list of things that you should be able to know how to do by the time this lecture is ended. Here's today's list. After this lecture, you should be able to define the following terms. Matter, element, atom, molecule, compound, pure substance, mixture, gas, liquid, solid, homogeneous versus heterogeneous, solution, physical change versus chemical change, and precision versus accuracy. You should also be able to classify substance according to figure 1.9 from our text, have memorized the SI units shown in table 1.4, have memorized the following prefixes from table 1.5, milli, micro, nano, and kilo, and if given formulas, be able to interconvert between Kelvin, Fahrenheit, and Celsius scales. So with that said, let's launch into today's lecture. What is matter? Well, simply put, matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. What is an element? An element is the most basic unit of matter, unable to be broken down into smaller units through chemical means. Simple definition for that is elements are the things found on the periodic table. This leads perfectly well into my sharing a humorous chemistry joke that's been superimposed onto the funny picture of a cat. As you'll see by watching my video lectures, I really like these humorous chemistry cats, which I get from quickmeme.com. This one reads, Do you have mass? Do you occupy space? If so, you matter. <laughs> All right. So my simple definition of an element was the things found on the periodic table. But what is the periodic table, you ask? Well, the periodic table is this. It's an organized table showing every chemical element known to humankind. By way of interest, did you know that 90% of the Earth's crust, including oceans and the atmosphere, is comprised of just five elements? These five are oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, and calcium. Separately, did you know that 90% of our bodies, as well as those of pretty much all other life that we know of, are comprised of just three elements? These elements are oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Isn't that neat? I thought so. <laughs> so now we hammer home some hardcore vocabulary, and honestly, Lecture 1 and the first few lectures of any general introductory science course are going to be a lot like this. Vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary. Why? Because you have to learn the language of science. And just like any language that you need to learn, there is tons of vocabulary. So, here's our first term. 
on this slide. Atoms. What is an atom? It is the infinitesimally small building blocks of matter. Now, as you could well imagine, we could zoom into a country such as the United States using Google Earth to see some of the country's more detailed components. In the case of this country, we can zoom in to see the states. So we'll zoom in over here. You can see all kinds of different states. If you zoom in further into Pennsylvania, for example, you can see it broken up into various counties. You zoom in further and you can see individual cities. And if you zoom in further, very, very close, you can actually see individual buildings, cars, and even people. Similarly, if we could zoom into something like our skin really closely, we would see that it's actually made up of various tissues which are comprised of individual cells. If we zoomed in further, we would see that these cells are made up of multiple complex structures which are then comprised of even smaller individual polymers. These polymers are, in turn, if we zoomed into those, we would see that they are made up of even smaller building blocks that are bonded together, which if we zoomed in even further, we could see on the tiniest, most zoomed in perspective are comprised of individual atoms, the tiniest building blocks of matter. Okay, technically there's some stuff that's even tinier than an atom, but I'll save that for a later lecture. Here are two photos of two different pure substances, iron, whose periodic table abbreviation is FE, and silicon, whose pre periodic table abbreviation is SI. Assuming that these two samples pictured here were actually pure, we could surmise that this bar of iron is made up of nothing but zillions and zillions of different atoms of iron all bonded together. I realize that zillion isn't technically a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Now similarly, we could say such a thing about this bar of silicon. Assuming that it doesn't contain any other contaminants in it, this metallic bar is comprised of zillions and zillions of individual silicon atoms all bonded together. Isn't that neat? Oh yeah! So that leads me to have to say this definition. The word is molecules. What is a molecule? It's substance made up of two or more atoms joined together. So now we know what atoms are, and we know what molecules are. What really are molecules? Well, as it turns out, molecules are basically things, as I said, that are made up of two or more atoms. Here are some models showing us a few different molecules. The first one is oxygen, which is actually made up of two different atoms of oxygen bonded together. The next one is water, which is made up of one oxygen atom shown in red and two hydrogen atoms shown in white bonded together, H2O. A third example I have is carbon dioxide, which we exhale. It's made of one carbon atom shown here as a central black ball bonded to two individual oxygen atoms, which are colored as red. Now I should specify here that there are actually two different kinds of molecules. Homonuclear molecules consist of two or more atoms of the same element bonded together. Compounds, in contrast, are molecules that are made up of two or more atoms of different elements bonded together. So in this example, oxygen is a homonuclear molecule because it's made up of two different oxygen atoms. They are the same element bonded together while water and carbon dioxide are both considered compounds because each of them have multiple different kinds of elements bonded together. Here are a few different examples as well. This is a structural model of ethanol, which is also made up of multiple different elements bonded together. This one is ethylene glycol, and this one is aspirin. You can see that all of these substances are all compounds. Oxygen, once of course, is a molecule as well, but it's a homonuclear molecule because all the elements in it, which are two atoms of oxygen, are the same element. I hope that makes sense. All of these are molecules. One is homonuclear, and the other are all considered compounds. Now, all molecules, be they homonuclear molecules or compounds, can exist in three general different physical states, gas, liquid, or solid. In this seascape image of an iceberg floating in water, we could imagine water molecules existing simultaneously in all three of these states. The ice is comprised of solid water, the ocean is made of liquid water, and we could imagine there are actual gaseous water molecules floating around in the air. So I ask you, generally speaking, in which state of matter, gas, liquid, or solid, 
are the individual molecules furthest apart? In which state do you think they are second furthest apart? And in which state do you think they're closest together? Gas, liquid, or solid? I'm not going to answer the question, but I want you to think about it. And now for some more vocabulary. Strictly speaking, a pure substance is a collection of matter in which all of the molecules are the same throughout. These molecules can either be made up of a single element or a single compound throughout. Here are some examples. Once again, we've seen iron before. This is sort of a model showing very, very closely all of the individual iron atoms bonded together. You can see that if there are no other substances in there, no other molecules other than individual iron atoms bonded together, this would be considered a pure substance. By comparison, table salt, sodium chloride, is actually a compound. It's made up of sodium atoms, which are abbreviated periodic table as Na, and chloride ions, which are abbreviated as Cl. Sodium and chloride gets together and forms this compound, table salt. If we have a big pile of table salt and there are no other compounds or elements in it other than Na and Cl bonded together, then we would say that that pile of table salt is a pure substance. This shows a zoomed in model of what an individual cluster of sodium chloride would look like. Pure substance contrasts with mixtures. In mixtures, we find collections of matter in which the materials present are made up of two or more pure substances, which can either be elements or compounds. Most of the stuff that we interact with every day are mixtures. I've shown this in this example, which is a zoomed up picture of a granite countertop. Granite is comprised of multiple different pure substances, both elements and compounds, all mixed together. Mixtures can be one of two types, either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous mixtures are mixtures that are uniform throughout. In other words, the various things in them have all been uniformly dispersed or spread out uh, perfectly evenly. Homogeneous mixtures are also sometimes called solutions. Now, heterogeneous mixtures are mixtures that are not uniform throughout. So the individual things in them are not evenly spread out or evenly dispersed throughout the mixture. Heterogeneous mixtures can be easily separated, or the, comp the components of heterogeneous mixtures can often be easily separated by physical means. Now, this brings me to a sample lecture question that I'm going to ask you. Identify each of the following as being homogeneous or heterogeneous. Wood, tap water, dirt, and air. I'm not going to answer it to you, but we'll let you instead think about it on your own. One way that you can do so is by using this figure from our text as a guide. By going down this hierarchical diagram, you can easily classify any substance into the various subcategories shown here in these cute little pink boxes. <laughs> Enjoy! I think you'll have fun in this vocabularical minutia. Which leads us perfectly into our first lecture question from our problem set. A combination of sand, salt, and water is an example of a blank. I'm going to let you look at this and see if you can figure out what the answer is. We now turn to a different subject, chemical versus physical change. Is there a difference between a chemical change and a physical change? As it turns out, yes there is. A physical change is a change in which a substance's physical appearance changes, but its chemical composition does not. Here are some examples. When water melts, it turns from a solid to a liquid. Is the liquid water still H2O? Is the solid water H2O? If the answer is yes, and it is, then melting water is not a chemical change. It's just a physical change. Another example is dissolving salt, sodium chloride, in water. When sodium chloride, whose chemical formula is NaCl, dissolves in water, is it still NaCl after the process is complete? Yes, it is. Because its chemical formula hasn't changed, the process is just a physical process, not a chemical one. This brings us to the next question. What is a chemical change? Well, a chemical change is a change in which a substance's chemical composition has been altered. One example is when we react a copper penny with nitric acid.
the copper, whose chemical formula is Cu, interacts with the nitric acid to form a new compound called copper nitrate. Does copper nitrate have a different chemical formula from the original copper? You bet it does. So is this a chemical change instead of just a physical one? Absolutely. Another example is passing an electric current through water. When this happens, water, whose chemical formula is H2O, undergoes a change in which the hydrogen, the H part of the water, and the oxygen, the O part, separate and form two new separate and individual substances, H2 and O2. Do H2 and O2 separately have different formulas from the original H2O from which they came in this process? Yes, they do. Hence, this is a chemical change and not just a physical change. Now, for your reference, if any of you guys are interested, I have two instructional videos on my YouTube channel showing the separation of water into individual H2 and O2 gases. The links for those two videos are shown right here on this slide. Remember then, to distinguish between a physical change and a chemical change, just ask yourself the question, during this change, does the chemical formula of anything change? If so, then it's a chemical change. If not, then it's a physical change. Physical changes are usually the kinds of things where something is converted from one physical state to another, such as liquid turning into a solid, or vice versa, liquid turning into a gas, or vice versa, or a solid turning into a gas, or vice versa. Other examples of physical changes, including things such as if I were to take a big rock and pulverize it into dust, or take a newspaper and tear it into little pieces. I haven't changed the chemical formulas of any of the substances in those original items. I've only broken them down physically. Hence, those are physical changes rather than chemical changes. So does that make sense? Good. Then you're probably ready to do the following question. In the following list, only blank is not an example of a chemical reaction. We now turn to a different subject, which is once again another description of vocabulary. What is the difference between precision and accuracy? For a layperson, absolutely nothing. But for a scientist, these two terms are not the same thing. Strictly speaking, precision is how close a series of different measurements are to each other. The closer they are, the more precise they are. The precision of a measurement is not the same as its accuracy. Accuracy, in contrast, is how close a measurement is to reality. Let's take a look at some examples to see if we can clarify the difference between these two terms. Let's pretend that I'm trying to throw a bunch of darts at a dartboard and hit the target. Let's pretend that I do that and all three of my darts land over here right next to each other. If the target represents an actual measurement, have I gotten anywhere near my actual measurement? The answer is no. Have all of my individual measurements, which are way off from reality, been near each other? The answer is yes. So this is an example where the archer is very, very precise, but not accurate. Remember, once again, that precision is how close to each other all of your measurements are. Now, in the second example, if I threw all of my darts, that is, if I took measurements and I saw that all of them were very, very close to each other and were very close to reality, we would say that my measurements have been both precise and accurate. In this latter example, we can see that I just threw darts all over the place, so I'm both imprecise and inaccurate. I hope you can see the difference between the two. I can have various measurements that are very, very precise, that is, they're very, very close to each other, but they might be very, very inaccurate if I'm using a poor scale that's about, I don't know, 90% off of what the actual weight of something is. In contrast, I can also have a, a in contrast, I can have a situation in which my scale does measure something a lot more close to being its accurate weight, but my different measurements may be very different from each other, so my measurement would be imprecise. I hope that's clear enough, the difference between precision and accuracy. 
Now I realize I'm throwing a boatload of different vocabulary terms at you, but honestly, as I mentioned before, that is what introductory science is often all about, learning a new language. Now with that said, I now want to introduce you to something called SI units. The SI stands for Système International, which is French for pass me the salt. Uh, though I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. In Spanish, SI can simply be said as C, which means yes, for all of you who are amazing advanced Spanish speakers. So this SI, or C, system, which is often called the metric system by us North Americans, or Estadounidenses, has certain base units. This table taken from our text shows those base units for various means of measurement. For example, if I'm using SI units to measure mass, the base unit that I will use is a kilogram. If I'm using SI units for length, the base unit that I use is a meter, and so forth and so on. My favorite unit on this table is that of luminous intensity, which is called a candela. I have to be honest, I have never once in my entire life ever, ever, ever used a candela. Hopefully I'll have the opportunity sometime, but I don't foresee that coming anytime soon. The beauty of the SI system is that it operates in mathematically simple intervals of 10. Thus, if we attach any of the prefixes shown in this table to the beginning of one of our base units, we are effectively talking about a multiple of that base unit that is divisible by a factor of 10. For example, a decimeter shown right here in this table is one-tenth of a meter. A centimeter shown down here is one one-hundredth of a meter and so forth. In contrast, a kilometer or kilometer <laughs> is 1,000 meters and so forth and so on. Although there are many more SI prefixes in existence than the ones that are shown here on this table, these are the most common ones that you will encounter in your everyday lives. For my class, I'm requiring you, my students, to memorize the prefixes shown in pink. Not just their names, but also to what exponents of 10 each of them correspond. With your command of SI units now, you should easily be able to figure out the answer to the next question. Of the following, blank is the smallest mass. Which brings us to our final subject, interconverting between different systems of temperature. As we North Americans know, ice water is really cold. In our North American temperature system, the Fahrenheit system, ice water stands at a temperature of around 32 degrees. But what if you're from a different country and you use the SI or metric system? Why, for you, the temperature of ice water is even colder. It's zero degrees. So is the temperature really different? <laughs> Absolutely not. The only difference is the system of measurement. And not to criticize my American roots, of which I am stalwartly proud, but our system of measurement for the f most part is really ridiculous. <laughs> As it turns out, there's a third system of measurement called the Kelvin system. And how does it compare to Celsius and Fahrenheit? Well, we can see by looking at this figure. We'll notice that in Celsius, water boils at 100 degrees. In Kelvin, water boils at 373.15. In Celsius, water freezes at zero degrees. In Kelvin, water freezes at 273.15 kelvins. Isn't that interesting? Now, Fahrenheit is, of course, all over the place. Fahrenheit boils at, sorry, in Fahrenheit, water boils at 212. And it freezes at 32. I have no idea where they came up with those numbers or how they arranged the scale. Celsius and Kelvin, of course, were set at a scale corresponding to the boiling and freezing points of temperature at sea level, which are very, very convenient. We see, then, that Celsius and Kelvin have identical scales. The only difference is that they are separated by 273.15 degrees. Thus, if we were converting from Kelvin to Celsius, we would use this equation. Kelvin equals whatever the Celsius temperature is plus 273.15. Similarly, if we were going in the opposite direction, Celsius degrees equal whatever the Kelvin temperature is minus 273.15. And by the way, I do require you, my students, to memorize this equation. But what about interconverting between Celsius and Fahrenheit? Well, for that interconversion, we use these equations. 
degrees Celsius equals 5 ninths times degrees Fahrenheit minus 32, of course, with these little brackets in place. And degrees Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths times Celsius plus 32, bracketed like this. Uh, yeah, I realize that's super confusing. So I promise you that if I give you any exams in which you have to interconvert between Celsius and Fahrenheit, I will give you these equations rather than requiring you to memorize them. But I do require you to memorize the interconversion between Celsius and Kelvin. To put your final knowledge to the test, we now finish with our last lecture problem. Which of the following is the highest temperature? I'll let you look at these examples and see if you can figure it out on your own. So that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Please tune into our next lecture, which will continue our introductory discussion on general chemistry. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.